Hi, this is Raymond Solder, and we're back to chapter 15 of Taylor Caldwell's marvelous book, I, Judas. Now, we learned in this last chapter that she is putting a twist on the story of Judas that I personally like. I've never thought that Judas, in despair, would kill himself without a reason bigger than the fact that he had betrayed Jesus because Jesus forgives sins. Big ones, whoppers, little ones. So let's get into chapter 15. Pilot. Oh, by the way, you do have to ask for forgiveness when you know you've crossed the line. This man held the power of life and death over us all. And yet all I could think of was that there was not a single solitary hair on his gleaming yellow skull. I watched, fascinated, as he brushed a meaty hand over his glistening head and regarded at us with a mocking smile. He was taller than I would have thought, and his broad sloping shoulders and his thick corded neck, which merged with his chin, gave him the look of a gladiator. This impression was enhanced by the leather curious he still fancied, with the flat broadsword dangling arrogantly from his hip. It was easy to see he wanted none to forget that he was no mere administrator, but had commanded the legions of Rome in battle. He kept no court at the fortress, even though his quarters, originally designed by Herod the Great for Mark Anthony's comfort, were lavish enough for an emperor. His only courtiers were the palace guard, hulking brutes, who stood immobile behind him, holding their spears upright. They were from every segment of the empire, swarthy Nubians from the Sudan, red freckled picks from the far islands of Britain, giant long-armed Franks, and grotesque Germans with their blonde manes flowing to their hips. It was it, a graphic it gave a graphic meaning to the word Rome, as none knew better than the man who arranged this show. He seemed in no hurry to get to the matter, considering his visitor's anxiety not to keep him waiting. But so it was with those who have the upper hand. They invariably let one know it. And it finally suited him to speak. You are late, he said angrily. We came as quickly as we could, said Annas. Having hatched some plot in your devious minds, we are sorry for what happened in Rome. Sorry, wrong voice. We are sorry for what happened in Rome, said Gamaliel with mistaken dipl diplomacy. Pontius Pilate put his hands on his hips and gave us an insolent look. Nothing has transpired that you Jews need concern yourselves with. Mind your own behavior, 
and worry not about Rome. Does the worm concern itself for the sparrow, or the sparrow fret for the hawk? The Nazi, said Annas, meant only that we deplore any inconvenience the emperor has suffered, for he has been our friend for these many years. True enough, Tiberius has given your nation many privileges, a legacy from the days of the divine Julius, who was befriended by Herod in Egypt. But we Romans don't live in the past. Nobody save the emperor is indispensable. How easy it was for him to dismiss the friend and patron to whom he owed so much. He held up an imposing sheet of parchment on which the imperial insignia of Rome was clearly discernible. This came from Rome, he said in a grating voice. Every sign of revolt, however slight, is to be put down without mercy. Every revolutionary is to be nailed to the cross. Where there is no overt act against Roman authority, the procurator will deal with it directly where the resistance is to the local authority. The temple is qualified to handle the matter in its own courts. Anna's eyes blank for a moment. But you forget that only the procurator can impose a capital penalty. Well, that was done for your own protection so your rival factions would not engage in a bloodbath disruptive to the governing body here and in Caesarea. We may try the culprit, but only you can execute the verdict, Annas persisted. Pilate's jaw said in the hard lines so typical of his breed, have you already prejudged this matter? To be so sure of the outcome? It should be promptly placed before our courts. For it is our desire that the Roman authority know that we are moving energetically to stamp out revolt. Pilate poked a finger at Ennis and laughed riotlessly as he saw him squirm. Now, what game are you Jews up to? Annas inclined his head in a slight bow. I know not what the prosecutor means. My meaning is plain. You Jews are always up to something. We came at your request, Anna said impassively. Pinelet laughed scornfully, showing his strong white teeth. His dark face glistened with perspiration, though the room was cool, and he mopped his brow with a red cloth. Let us not pretend. You are quarrelsome, the whole lot of you and would kill one another off if I didn't keep you in line. He laughed uproariously, as if he found the idea amusing. I hated all Romans, but some were worse than others. Pontius Pilate, in his vulgar way, epitomized 
the worst of Rome. How I wish the master were here now, not cringing like the tactful Gamaliel or temporizing like Annas, but standing up to the Roman defiantly and breathing fire as he had done with the Sadducees and Pharisees. I could hardly wait for the moment when the proud Pilate would kneel before his superior power. There was something in my demeanor that caught Pilate's attention at this time. He scowled fiercely as his gaze fell on me. Who is this flaming-eyed youth who keeps clenching and unclenching his fists like an aggrieved gladiator? At least there is some fight in him. Gamaliel stepped forward. This is Judah Bar Simon, whom we mentioned earlier. He comes from a family distinguished for their public service. All you Israelites are distinguished. <laughs> Like the Britons, you <laughs> have a king on every hillock. <laughs> Not so, Excellency, put in Annas. We have no king. The one presumes this role. You were wrong, priest, for you do have a king, and his name is Tiberius. It will go ill with any who usurps his royal prerogatives. With a mocking glance for his visitors, whom he kept standing, the deputy of Rome flung himself under the curial chair, traditionally reserved in Rome for the highest dignitaries. It was a gift of Herod the Great, like everything else in the fortress Antonia, from the clusters of bronze candelabra hanging from the frescoed ceiling to the marble floors adorned with rich carpeting from Persia. His deep-set eyes, bridged by the prominent Roman nose, surveyed the small delegation with undisguised contempt. Because of your indolence and your treachery, our caravans are attacked, our arsenals looted, our soldiers ambushed on lonely roads. If you do not have the leaders soon in hand, I shall swiftly step in and handle it for you. His eyes looked out menacingly from under their black beetle brows. It will go badly with all of Israel if you seek to trick me with bogus arrests. The massacre of the Galileans will be like a Grecian festival, for I shall smite the whole land from Perea to Galilee, and not excluding Judea, with the might of the empire. The emperor is in no mood to dally with traitors, and neither is he who speaks for him. Annas preserved his calm. We already know the ringleader, and it would be a simple matter with his arrest to apprehend the others and break up the movement. Pilate crossed his brawny arms over his chest. 
And this culprit you speak of is this the same Joshua Bar Abbas, whom my agents tell me is the firebrand of the zealot cause? Annas recoils slightly. It is not of whom I speak, it isn't he. Then your information is better than mine. <laughs> For Barabbas has been seen leading these raids I speak of. The man I speak of is Joshua Bar Joseph, a Galilean, whom the Gentiles call Jesus. Pilate's missile-shaped head came up quickly, and the flaps of his big ears twitched. This Galilean you speak of, is he not the healer from Nazareth? So he says. Pilate gave him a scornful look. You don't know? Hmm. Your agents tell you that he is a revolutionary, but don't know that he heals? What kind of agents do you employ? I was pleasantly surprised and encouraged by Pilate's attitude. Tell me more about this dangerous Galilean. Is he not the one who overturned the tables in the temple and mocked the high priests, earning the plaudits of the people? Annas flushed, while Caiaphas, strangely quiet, bit his lip. If it were only this, it could be handled very quietly by the Sanhedrin without disturbing your excellency. But our agents have evidence of his dangerous nature, and it would well behoove the procurator to become acquainted with certain facts. Pilate gave him a withering look. Don't tell me my business, priest. Despite my contempt for Annas, my blood boiled, for his humiliation was Israel's as well. Would you not know what this man has done? Pilate's eyes swept over Caiaphas for the first time. So the chief prosecutor speaks. Tell me not what crime he has committed or what conspiracy he has woven, for this is not the time of place. But in your own proceedings, make sure that you have the right man before you come to me. I am no tool for your subtle plotting and intrigue. For that, good Herod, it's only half Jew, to be sure, but the Greek half is no better, for it is full of empty talk. He chuckled as if to himself, his thin, bloodless lips tightening over his teeth. He still resents my slaying the Galileans without his permission. But how was I to know they were from his tetrarch? Does not one Jew look like another? It was more than any man could bear. No more, <clears throat> no more, said I warmly, than every Roman resembles another. Gamaliel appeared stricken and even the high priests reacted uneasily. But the Roman only slapped his thigh and roared. This rooster <laughs> has some spirit. I like that. 
This is the man, said Caiaphas, who is thoroughly familiar with the insurrectionary movement. And how could he be familiar without being one of them? Annas had indeed looked ahead. He infiltrated the movement as our agent. So you see, we have not been lax. Pilate waved a careless hand. Oh, please, don't burden me with your loyalty. This Jesus must be a thorn in your side, or you would not be so solicitous of his movements. He gave the two priests an evil look. Does he threaten your coffers with his preachings? Or is it your very positions that are at stake? Hmm? Rest assured, for Rome appoints the high priests, and Rome prefers the devil it knows to the devil it doesn't know. His eyes skipped over me lightly. And so this is the man who can speak of the king of the Jews. How well do you know the Galilean? I've been with him for two and a half years. He looked at me disdainfully. As a spy, as his disciple, he laughed without amusement. With a disciple like you, none needs adversaries. I have nothing but good to say for him. Then why are you here? We're not recommending him for office. To speak the truth. I teetered delicately on the edge of a knife. For I wanted to see Jesus challenged so he could confront the Romans and triumph over them. And yet I had no wish to play the betrayer, even innocently. And what is the truth? There was a snare on the thin, pale lips. I am suspicious of those who speak of truth, for the truth needs no one to speak for it. It speaks for itself. Let it speak then. He's a good and kind man who feeds the poor, heals the sick, and worships the one God. Oh, yes, <laughs> that God. From his smirk, Pilate seemed to be enjoying himself. Why is it that Rome, with its many gods, rules the land which has this omnipotent wonder that nobody sees? Is it because we have many? And you, only one. Anna spoke up with a frown. This is no matter for a plain citizen, but a priest. Pilate held back his head and roared with laughter. <laughs> I have heard <laughs> the priests. Now I want truth. Didn't he say he stood? <laughs> for truth. He did not intimidate me. A brave man dies but once and dying might find the eternity Jesus spoke of. He is our Messiah, the promised one of Israel, sent by our God to deliver our nation from its enemies. Again, he bellowed with laughter. <laughs> and now, 
Will he do this? <laughs> With a slingshot? <laughs> or perchance he'll bring down this fortress with his bare arms, like your Samson. You see, I know your history, and I must say the past is more impressive than the present. Now tell me more about this king of the Jews. He doesn't say that he's the king of the Jews. What else is your Messiah? I've been in this blighted land for two and a half years. And all I hear are mutterings of this son of the King David, who is coming to lead Israel to victory over all the nations of the world, including Rome. Now that does not smack of humility to me, for how else can he rule? Unless he is king, whatever title he takes, they offered him the crown, but he would not take it. At this he jumped off his chair and put his face close to mine, scowling darkly. Who offered him this crown? Who? 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 I had no desire to implicate Cestus or Dismas and the others. There were so many that I couldn't distinguish one from another. From the smiles that passed between Annas and Caiaphas, I realized I'd blundered. In trying to balance the truth, I'd slipped off the edge of the knife. By many, I mean only enough so that I could not pick out any two or three. I know well enough what you mean. And how did Jesus react to this offer? He was disturbed that the multitude didn't understand what kingdom he spoke of. And he gave me a grim look. So he spoke of the kingdom of the Jews. Oh, that's it. That's the emperor. So he spoke of a kingdom of the Jews, did he? A kingdom of heaven for Jew and Gentile alike. It was no temporal power that he sought. I seemed to be involving Jesus in a way I hadn't thought to do. It might be well to examine this, Jesus. I hear he is a harmless man who helps people in his own way, not caring whether they are Jews or Romans. But it will do no harm to see for myself what manner of man he is. A frown ruffled the dark brow. Rome has little patience with rebellion, or with these endless conversations. That is for decadent Greeks and Egyptians. He waved a jeweled hand in dismissal. You have your temple gods and other conscripts. Use them well. I'll be watching closely. And if you do not act with vigor, you can count on the procurator of Judea to atone for your lack. He made no move to show out the three loftiest dignitaries in all of Judea, but instead motioned for me to stay. I would talk further with this disciple of the Galilean. The high priest glanced at each other uneasily, and into Gamaliel's long face 
there came a look of concern. Judah is a loyal son of Israel, he said resolutely. Pilate grinned wickedly. I know not whether that is an endorsement or an indictment, but don't fear, for I like his face has all the mobility of the dissembler. He would make a splendid high priest. The three leaders of the highest governing body of Israel backed out of his presence as if they were common slaves. If Jesus could only have witnessed this ignominy, would he not relent in his wrath and do what he could to correct this situation. Pilate's rough voice broke in on me. From Greek and Aramaic passing now to Latin. I understand that you've been in Rome. I've had that pleasure. I replied in Latin so that he knew that I was no country bumpkin. There is somebody who would speak to you. He motioned curtly to the guards, instructing him in a low voice. My heart leaped in joy. The good sense prevailed. The procurator of Judea was hardly a matchmaker. In a few moments, the mystery was resolved. A woman of surpassing beauty, with the clean limbs and clear-cut features of the Palace Athen, gracefully preceded a burly guard into the room. I had never seen a lovelier woman. Her soft auburn hair, blending with her delicately tinted skin, was tied back in a little knot in the Roman fashion. Her nose was finely chiseled and her eyes of rare violet seemed to give off a luminous glow under perfectly arched brows of shaded gold. But it was her manner I found most captivating she looked at me with an expression that seemed to suggest I was the most important person in the world. I'd never been with royalty before and found it disconcerting. But the lady Claudia Procula soon put me at ease. Tell me about your Jesus, she said as Pilate stood attentively behind her. I've had many dreams of him. She laughed at my puzzled face. My handmaiden, Susanna, pointed him out once from my litter. He would be a handsome man if he were not so solemn. I was in a quandary, not knowing what I could say that would be beneficial to him, for she was clearly well disposed. Nevertheless, it would be well to be non-committal, for what Jew could count on a Roman for anything? You know, of course, that he cured Susanna. She laughed, and her laugh was like a bell. You need not be guarded with me, sir, as my husband will tell you. I have a genuine interest in this man, and thought perhaps if I knew more of him, I could better understand these dreams that I have. She smiled roguishly. I hear he is dedicated solely to his God. So there can be none but the most virtuous explanations 
put upon these dreams? Well, I am no interpreter of dreams, but her, if Her Excellency will confide her dream, perhaps I can relate it in some way to the master. She laughed again. So, yeah, you call him the master? How quaint. For in Rome we have but one master, and he is a Claudian like myself. Pilate opened his mouth to say dryly, he is a Julian now. My adoption, she said carelessly. But ceremony is not nearly as thick as blood. Pilate seemed to worry, weary of this bandage. Tell the lady what she would know. I like not words that add up to nothing. She gave him a look of displeasure. Don't frighten our young friend with your faces, for I'm sure if properly coaxed, he can clear up this mystery for me. I understood from the centurion Cornelius that many Roman aristocrats were revolted by the corruption of the court. But it hardly seemed possible that this beautiful lady was moved by anything more than her idle curiosity prompted by the boredom of a life so far from Rome. If you but relate the dream. She frowned, as if searching her memory. Has your master been in Rome? I shook my head. Egypt, but nothing more. It is curious then, for in this dream, I saw him standing in the forum, alone amid the ruins. There wasn't a building that was not torn down, and he surveyed the rubble with a smile. The smile upset me. For I didn't understand how he could smile in all this devastation. I spoke to him. Sir, why is it that you smile when the city is destroyed? He looked at me kindly, saying, From these ruins shall come a greater empire than the world has seen one that eclipses the kingdoms of bronze and gold and silver and iron, and it shall be as fair and as air and water, for there shall be no limit to it. I was startled by the allusion to the four kingdoms. For this assuredly came out of Daniel's prophecy. Still, how did one tell a Roman that the dream signified the end of their tyranny and the advent of God's realm? I have heard Jesus say that though the majesty of Rome the word of God would one day spread from one end of the empire to the other. Pilate had made a pretense of not listening, but now he snorted angrily. This Jesus is either a fool or a knave to speak such nonsense. It would be treason if it were not so absurd. Claudia Procula made no sign that she even had heard him. Susanna has talked of this God, saying that your master heals through him. 
Her lovely brow wrinkled in her perplexity. Is he like our Jupiter or Apollo, to whom we've raised many statues in the hope they will look on us with favor? He is the God of Israel, and he dwells in the heavens with his angels. She clapped her hands in delight. He must know Jupiter then, <laughs> for there also does he reign. And there too Apollo rides his chariot through the skies. It is a different God that Jesus speaks of. He's not only the creator of the universe, but is of the universe ready to share our lives by virtue of our faith in him. She had difficulty following me, and no wonder, for only from Jesus did it make sense. But how else could I explain it? It was easy to see why Jesus had to perform his healings and other good works to establish his credibility. There was a Roman directness about her. Now, what relation does this Jesus have to this God that you speak of? He is the messenger sent by God to redeem his people from their sins and help them find eternal salvation. Pilate's harsh laugh broke in. Ha <laughs> This accursed state should give me thanks, for I have helped a good many into this eternity. Claudia Procula seemed unaware of her husband's existence. Did they not call him the Messiah? Yes, he is the promised one predicted by our prophets. Pilate again interrupted. <laughs> and what does he promise? <laughs> this king of the Jews, the kingdom of heaven. I'm sure he <laughs> would make a heaven and of earth if he could. The lady threw Pilate a look of annoyance. I would know of this man who heals the sick and comforts the poor and oppressed. I have heard reports that he can do anything, even to raising the dead and changing water to wine. Pilate let out a raucous laugh. You listen too much, <laughs> dear little Jewess. The desire to defend Jesus overcame prudence. I've seen Jesus do these things and more. She came forward now and her eyes peered into mine. With your own eyes you've seen this? I nodded, while Pilate threw up his hands in disgust. Her eyes glowed with new excitement. I I recall now the puzzling end of the recurring dream. Standing in the ruins, your master looked down on the prone figures of several emperors and with the waves of his hand restored them to the living. It could have signified either the restoration of the empire or the emergence of a new way of life, just as Jesus' vision on the mountain portended a new faith. Pilate's patience had grown thin. At least this dream man resurrected the empire. <laughs> Thank him for that, oh yes. And let this man go back to his master. She sighed in resignation. This dream I dreamed 
many times. So I know it must mean something. I hesitated, wondering if I dared to ask a favor. I have one request, if I may. Ask it, for much has been asked of you. May I give my greetings to the Lady Susanna? Pilot grunted. And the Lady Susanna. Now what is these Jews give themselves? She smiled. The aristocrat losing herself in the woman. You must be the disciple she has spoken of. But have you not taken the vow of celibacy? Pilot guffawed. He looks not the part of Vestal Virgin to me. We take no vows of this nature. I felt the blood rush to my face. Pilot gave me a shrewd glance. You stretch the truth so thin that one can see through it. He turned to his wife. But bring the maid in. What can they do that has not been done before? I thought that he stood in awe of her, but it was difficult for people to share a bed and still have illusions of grandeur about each other. His manner toward, toward me became ironically deferential. Claudia Procula, said he, since this young man has now become our guest, Nothing is too good for him. As she frowned, he guided me into a spacious chamber of the great hall. The room was windowless with a strangely speckled ceiling. Huge bowls of fruit sat on a large center table with goblets of red and white wine. Near a cluster of large pillows an immense divan and couch faced each other. The light from a naphtha lamp cast its eerie shadows on the walls and gave one a feeling of contrived intimacy. It reminded me of a room in a Roman brothel. Pilot gave me a searching glance. I was young like yourself, and I know what it is to carry the vision of a maid in the mind. It does no good there, not if you have any red blood in your veins. I don't think of her in that way. Then what do you think of her? as one who loves the master as I do. His hard eyes roamed offensively over my body. What for your loins, if not to establish that you are a man? There are other ways of proving one's manhood. He laughed and clapped me on the shoulder. Well said, Judabiah Simon. In the field against the enemy, is that not right? As I remained silent, he studied me ostentiously. If you like not women, is it men that appeal to you? To be sure, there are twelve or thirteen disciples. I am told in a woman to distract or divert them. This isn't a wholesome arrangement. My cheeks burned at the implication. We have a company of women attached to our mission, I said defensively. And so your vows of celibacy 
are conveniently displaced. I was tired of this, Roman scribes. There is no more virtuous. There is no more virtuous man than Jesus Christ. And he demands the same rigid standards of his disciples. This isn't Rome, where Julius Caesar was every woman's man and every man's woman. His dark eyes blazed for a moment and I flinched in spite of myself. He was breathing hard, his nostrils flaring. But then suddenly he tossed his head back and roared with laughter. <laughs> this Benton cock mocks the divine Julius. <laughs> that is a good one to be told in Rome. <laughs> he grabbed my arm and squeezed it so that the flesh turned purple and I pressed my lips to hold back a cry of pain. Anytime he wants, he said between his teeth, Rome can crush you and your friends just like that. Remember that? Always. And then he was gone with his thin, mirthless smile. How I hated these vulgar men who vaunted their far-flung military might over a small nation. O oh God of Israel, I prayed, let Jesus fling the gauntlet back in their faces. O oh Lord, let him see the light and be another Moses to the stricken people of Israel. So caught up was I in my thoughts that I didn't see Susanna enter the room. She greeted me with a flutter of the eyelids. She was so ravishingly beautiful. I barely resisted the impulse to take her in my arms. A simple robe which flared at the sides revealed a fleeting glimpse of her golden thighs and set my heart pumping. Her tawny hair fell over her rosy face and she pushed it back with a charming gesture, explaining with a blush that she had hastened at her mistress's summons. Forgive me for looking as I do, she breathed. Did you know it was for me she summoned you? Not till I saw you. We sat together on the long, low couch, designed for reclining at a feast. And I was very much aware of the sweet aroma of her body. It was like the smell of musk. I've missed you, I said, taking her hands. They were warm and moist. She didn't look at me directly, but kept her head bowed so that I saw the golden strands of hair forming on the nape, nape of her swan-like neck. I'd missed the whole company, especially the master, she said softly. But as long as he is well, I am happy. Suddenly a cloud glazed her eyes, and she gripped the edge of my robe. Your being here with Pilate, has it something to do with him? I had nothing to fret about. Pilate intends him no harm. She drew back a little, and her pale blue eyes looked deeply into mine. What brought you here? The procurator doesn't normally receive any Jews, but the high priests and the chiefs of the Sanhedrin. 
I answered truthfully. Pilate is concerned about the revolutionaries, and it was thought I could provide him with some information of their movements. Her eyes had now widened in alarm. But why should you, one of Christ's chosen, have this knowledge? I don't understand. This is not your province, I said more harshly than I intended. What do you know of plots and counterplots and the intrigue that imperils empires? My hand fell carelessly on her thigh, and in her agitation she didn't remove it. Her flesh was like silk under my hand. I know from Mary Magdalene, she said breathlessly, that he is in constant danger and won't do anything to spare himself. Claudia Procula herself tells me that it's not safe for him in Jerusalem at this time. Won't you carry him this word? Or tell me where he is and I will warn him myself. Well, that's not necessary. He knows whatever you know, and he does what he has to do. He is no frail craft to be pushed this way and that by every little ripple of foreboding. He is a man for the ages who lives for his God and can do anything that God can do. I've seen him do it and I don't doubt him. Now she took my hands in her gaze, and her eyes gazed into mine in a soulful manner. I've done you an injustice, Judah, for little did I realize that you could express yourself with such nobility. I see now why he selected you and gave you a seat next to him. You must love him as I do. I'd inched closer to her and could savor the warmth of her young body. She'd obviously dressed in haste, as she said, for she wore no undergarments. As her bosom heaved, I could barely see the delicate pink aureole of her sweet nipples in the soft marble of her breast. I thought of her body, taut and warm against mine, and my blood raced through my veins like wine. My hand fell casually on her bare shoulder and bent her just the least forward so that it seemed perfectly natural to brush my lips against hers. She didn't resist. Indeed, her breath only came faster, and she gave a little sigh. This time I pressed my lips against her mouth, and when her arms slipped around my shoulders, I crushed her body to mine. Please, don't do anything. Is it wrong to love? I said softly. She made no answer, and my hand dripped. I dropped idly now inside the robe and felt the swell of her naked breast. She gave a passionate cry and with her head lowered began to sob. As my head sank to her breast, I sensed the sharp intake of her breath and the straining of her body. Don't, don't, I'm a virgin. What else could she have been? For it was the sweet purity of her that incited my desire. 
My lips closed on hers. The time for conversation had ended and there was really nothing to say. She moaned and groaned and thrashed about as though in agony. And then she suddenly went limp in my arms. She gave a long sigh and it was over. I found myself, found myself disappointed and strangely empty. As I looked down on this damsel who had seemed so unattainable, I felt as if I had been cheated by her appearance of virtue. I was disenchanted by her easiness. Obviously her virginity had not been previously challenged. I love you. I truly love you. She looked at me like a sick cow. Do you love me? What did the silly handmaiden know of love? Of course I love you. Thank God. But there could be no marriage for you are pledged to Jesus and you also. I whispered in her ear. I drew myself now to a sitting position as she carefully rearranged her clothing, blushing at my gaze. She put her fingers to my lips. You will not say anything the little idiot. Who did you think I could mention this to? Of course not. Nobody will ever know. Thank you, dear Judah. There was a look of exultation in her eyes. There is nothing, nothing I wouldn't do for you. I love you. I looked at the heavenly laden table. Would you pour me a glass of wine? I'd never before felt so empty inside. She jumped up eagerly like a child and brought me the sparkling red grape. It was warming and restored my spirits. I'd been there perhaps an hour and was ready to leave, but as I stood up, there was a knock on the door. I could see the alarm in her eyes and felt a sudden uneasiness myself. The knock was repeated. I went to the door. Pontius Pilate stood in the doorway. You may go. You may go, he said to the girl. She ran from the room like a frightened fawn with a single imploring glance over her shoulder. His eyes peered beyond me to the couch. And so, my precious disciple of God, how did it go? We had a pleasant conversation. And you spoke of your God and life eternal <laughs> and the nobler things of life we barbarians do not understand is that not correct our conversation was private better you should say your intercourse i felt my blood run cold i don't understand his eyes moved up to the ceiling. Look closely. You have a young man's eyes. My eyes followed his, and I felt the blood drain out of my face. I felt faint and barely managed to say, did her excellency, oh no. I wouldn't have disabused her, even though I'm a vulgar Roman, and you 
are a cultured Jew. Involuntarily, my eyes moved upward again to the small speckle-like apertures that dotted the ceiling. Through these little peepholes, it's possible to see everything transpiring in this room. There was no doubting of that leering face. Now you deserved a little lesson. Whatever we are, we Romans are not hypocrites. We take what we want and we enjoy it. You think Rome corrupt, then what of you, my pious friend, who speaks loftily of this God and seduces innocent maids? His evil face still wore that mocking look. You cost me my dinner tonight. But no matter, it was worth it. <laughs> now, make haste to do what you have undertaken. And let nothing slip. For I will be watching. <laughs> Never fear. And that is the end of chapter 8. What a book. A chapter I chapter fifteen, sorry. What a book. Yep. Woo, what a book. And chapter sixteen, now we're getting there. The supper. This has to be in reference to the Last Supper. And let's come and watch that together. As Taylor called well. Does this novel of Judas Iscariot? <laughs>